Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Dr. Yasmin Hurd. Um, this worked out really well because I had emailed you and you said you might be in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that ended up happening, but three weeks later, I ended up being in New York. I know. It worked out perfectly. Yeah. I unfortunately, didn't end up going to Toronto, so glad you could make it to New York. Yeah, I'm really excited to speak with you specifically because I think the area of your research is, is really niche and, and pressing. So you kind of deal with, with two things that I think in, in culture are really interesting. The, you, you research addiction, which I think there's a big sort of taboo and stigma around. And then you also, you, you research cannabis, marijuana, which I think is getting a lot of attention just given things that are going on legally and you, the the use of it um, recreationally. So I want to talk about all of it with you because yes. I think you kind of, you kind of cover everything. So let, let's start with the, with addiction um, specifically. Um, you've devoted your, your life's work to studying addiction. Um, and as I, I mentioned, that's a bit of a, a, a taboo area of discussion. So, so why dedicate the, um, your work to, to studying addiction? That's a, you know, it's funny when you think about it, it's an important question. Mm -hmm. But it's also a tough question to answer because I think a lot of times people think, oh, you know, she's studying addiction or she went down this path <laughs> and she, you know, like you said, when you, when, it, when you said my life's work, I'm like, oh my God, my life's work, it becomes so uh, intense that I must have something really personal related to it. And to be honest, I didn't start off that way. Mm -hmm. I start off studying addiction mainly because of the impact it had on the brain. I was interested in neurodegenerative disorders. Oh, can't even say that early on. <laughs> um, like Parkinson's disease. Yeah. And I was, the, the cells that are destroyed really in Parkinson's disease or lesioned in the brain are these dopamine cells. Okay. And when we would tease out the dopaminergic system, you would use drugs that release dopamine or increase dopamine in the brain. And a lot of those were psychostimulant drugs like cocaine and amphetamine. And I was so drawn to how drugs change the brain. Right. That's how I got started in it. And then, you know, started to understand the impact of these drugs on people. And then definitely later on, I, I had people in my life who had a substance use problem, but I didn't start off that way. And, but the thing that has been so fascinating and sad mm -hmm. is that the reality of addiction on our society is very profound. And the neuroscience research that I thought I was going into just to be able to understand the brain had a much bigger impact. And the stigma that people suffer from it, I was just blown away with the degree to which our society, you know, puts this type of disorder on one level and other disorders that actually have impact on the similar neurobiological systems don't have that. Right. Uh, I think what you said there is really interesting because the underlying biology as a scientist is really interesting to you. Um, and then you said, as you were kind of like trudging along your career, um, you, you noticed this like societal response that um, it's, it's overwhelmingly negative. So what do you think society gets wrong about addiction? I think what society gets wrong about addiction um, and even people suffering from substance use disorders themselves is that they chose this path, that it's something about morality. And one of the things that is clear is that the majority of people who are, have this disorder, they didn't choose it. Many people will experiment with drugs, especially as teenagers and young adults. The majority of people live completely normal lives. However, for a subset, they went down a path that I don't think that they realized that their brains had. And the same thing is the question is, why do some people develop a depression? We can all go through certain stresses and, and many other things, yet still we, well, now today, I think mental illness, even though we still have certain stigmas about mental illness, mm -hmm. but even if we take you know, diabetes, cancers, and so on. Yeah. We, we feel for people who have those disorders, but no one said, oh, really, that person brought it on themselves. They used to perhaps in our society. Yeah. And we understand that certain quote-unquote life choices, but I don't think people understand that enough that these individuals do not choose to have their lives destroyed. 
their families' lives destroyed, their communities destroyed. And that morality comes into addiction for me is tough. And the same thing with mental illness. We walk along the streets, we see people, you know, homeless, looking, you know, begging for money. And a lot of those people have a mental illness and or substance use disorder comorbid. And we look at them a certain way that they right. chose this. And that I think the issue of psychiatric disorders for me, it's painful, even if, of course, you know, we want everybody to be healthy in our society, but it's painful that um, we think that these individuals brought it on themselves. Yeah, I think that's a great point because if you had said at the, like if you had proposed at the onset of someone's drug use that your life in five years would look like this um, in shambles, I don't think any rational person would choose that. And what you're suggesting through your scientific background is that this is not, it's, it's not a choice of morality that they just, they, they failed in some, some cosmic sense, um, that there's like an underlying biology there. Yeah. Um, so wh what is it that makes someone more vulnerable or susceptible um, to going down that path? Because like you said, I think in, in recent times, um, certain drugs have become more popular than others. People use them recreationally. People go through their early 20s doing all sorts of things, and then they turn 25, and then they're in the corporate world, and they're just fine. Exactly. But then for other people, they can never, they don't get out of that loop and their life at, at 25, 30, 35, you know, friends Six, leave. 55, all of that, they look back and their lives have been, they never reached their, their potential. Mm -hmm. Each of us, I believe, on this planet are here for a reason. It's not to um, consume drugs that we don't understand the reality that we're in, that our lives are destroyed. And I don't mean that we're here to cure cancer or, <laughs> you know, you know, build Maybe some of us are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I really hope build machines to go to, you know, to explore the universe. Yeah. I think that there is a, a global societal thing that we all contribute in our society, whether you are, you know, educating the next generation, all our kindergarten teachers. Yeah. Every single thing. It's like, you know, but when you look at certain individuals, we know certain things, for example, genetics that definitely plays a role in, in, in psychiatric disorder vulnerability. Early life, early life insults plays a significant role. And people don't realize that most psychiatric disorders are developmental in nature. We may diagnose them as adults. But we now know that something happens during early development that changes the trajectory of how the brain responds to things. So, for example, we can say that, you know, when you look at, um, there are some hypotheses, for example, in terms of intense immune dysregulation during certain developmental periods will make someone increase their vulnerability for uh, schizophrenia later in life. Some of my research looks mm -hmm. at developmental effects of cannabis. And in particular, for example, we see that, you know, um, in our animal models in particular, because we can do causal relationships there, that early exposure to THC will increase their, their sensitivity to, to self-administer more heroin when they're adults. Not every animal does that. There's still behavioral traits that make the difference. So behavioral traits play into vulnerability as well, whether it's impulsivity, behavioral traits, behavioral traits of higher reward sensitivity, um, you know, people who have uh, inhibitory control issues, but it's across the spectrum. But we also know huge effects of stress and early trauma increases. This is childhood trauma? Childhood trauma increases. In, in what ways, like a parental relationship or bullying or all types of abuse, all types of abuse. And that's also what kills my heart. Because in our society, every child, irrespective of their socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, whatever, mm -hmm. just, you know, aspect of loving life with, um, without, as you said, the word, you know, um, it's not just bullying in schools. It are, you know, abusive parents. There's a lot of stress when you think about certain communities that don't have resources, don't have right. the, the amount of stress that certain communities have, but definitely early life um, trauma 
we know has a big impact. Right. Uh, I'm, you're familiar with Dr. Gaber May? Um, the name For, is familiar. Yeah. So he works on addiction as well. And I, I was watching some of his stuff just in preparation to talking with you, just kind of getting a glimpse of addiction as a whole. And he said that um, people's conceptualization of addiction is wrong and that addiction, like you're saying, is not uh, like a moral failing, but it's actually a response to suffering. Um, like life is, is, is evidently very difficult. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people, um, and I will say even myself, so you could say you self-medicate. And I don't mean self-medicate. Some people, the self-medication hypothesis that people use drugs to normalize some of the things or to, to blunt some of the pain that they're feeling. Yeah. But, you know, everybody, you had a really tough day at work. You mm-hmm. go home. You say, okay, like. I need a glass of wine. <laughs> My glass is one glass, right. you know, and it's not I do this every day, but this is the thing. For other people, that stress then triggers, it's not that just one glass, it's two, and it's not wine, it becomes this big thing of vodka. And then yeah. before you, they know it, the weekend crashes and they have just like, you know, consumed all this alcohol. So for me, that is the issue that people don't understand. Our environment triggers certain things. And because in our society, we have become a society of drugs. So drugs are available wherever. So it, that contribution, that, that combination, our society is becoming much more stressful, the traumas that people um, experience. We have, we're n- not nurturing children in, in our society in the same ways that we did in the past. Right. They're not protected in the same way. And then because we're forcing them to grow up even faster, enjoy your childhood. It is the <laughs> only time. Enjoy it. Yeah, you know, yeah. It goes by very quickly. Um, and three, just substances are that impact the brain very powerfully are more available today than ever before. Right. I, I think most people have a sense of sort of some of those social dynamics that are at play when it comes to addiction. Like someone looks at someone... Um, who's homeless and just assumes they had a bad childhood, right? And maybe there's some merit to that. Maybe there isn't. No, not always. Right. I'm not saying there is or isn't, but I feel like people do have a sense of like, you know, there's, there's externalities that are responsible for like the, the behavior that you're seeing. I want to ask you as a neuroscientist. um, So there's like the social aspect of addiction, uh, like the, the things that we experience that contribute to this, but what's, what's the underlying biology? Um, What, what is going on with someone? So you study the brain. Um, so what is what does an addicted brain look like? Like what are some some features that are consistent with someone who's suffering from addiction? One of the things that we definitely see, and you know, in many different ways that neuroscientists have studied the brain, whether it's animal models or in vivo neuroimaging of the human brain, you see, for example, the prefrontal cortex, that mm-hmm. part of our brain that's really important for decision making, goal, you know. Every single aspect of our daily lives, we make decisions. And that, that particular brain area is compromised. And it's compromised in a manner where the, that top-down control normally is diminished. And instead, we have these, uh, these subcortical regions, these regions um, that are, we call them more limbic brain regions that are important for like emotional regulation, are, are highly sensitized. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, our a brain area called the amygdala, where you know, addiction is not a, a I say is not a disorder of reward. So we have you know brain regions that are very tightly linked to the prediction of reward and reward sensitivity. For example, the nucleus accumbens. Many people know it, and I mentioned dopamine before. Yeah, but that's what happens when you take the drug. But what keeps someone in addiction? is a lot of this craving, you know, so that they see something in the environment. Once again, the environment comes into play that was associated with their drug use. And that is enough to trigger the craving. And then um, they start taking the drug again. Or stress, once again, Mm -hmm. talking about Trump, just regular everyday stress could then trigger this craving. And brain regions such as this amygdala, another subcortical region, that's important for emotional regulation and so on, is hypersensitive. So you have these brain regions that are hypersensitive to stress, uh, hypersensitive to emotional and environmental cues, and you have the 
diminished top-down control from our prefrontal cortex. So those things together really makes a, a big difference for that individual with addiction. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a few areas of the brain. One of them that I wanted to highlight was the prefrontal cortex. Um, so you introduced me to your postdoc, uh, Jacqueline, who's, mm-hmm. who she does work in uh, drug use in adolescence. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something I wanted to touch upon. So the prefrontal cortex, um, my understanding is just in a general sense is that that's more or less the part of the brain that makes you, you. Yeah. I mean, I think all parts. So, you know, one of the things <laughs> that also that people as, as neuroscientists or scientists, we're very biased. So, you know, often we study this one brain area and another group may study another. Addiction is a whole brain disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, our brains, you know, our brain, talk, they talk, every single thing talks with each other. It's just that certain regions play a much more prominent role. And what makes you you is not just your prefrontal cortex, but that's where you're, you know, who you are, as you said, in terms of how do you perceive the world right. and how do you perceive yourself So th- is through, you know, the, the, the cortex. So absolutely. But I want to make sure people know that everything right, is right. talking with each other. Yeah. Fair. Uh, where I was going with that is that uh, the prefrontal cortex, correct me here if I'm wrong, uh, until 25 more or less, it's, it's developing. Yeah. And at the beginning of the, our conversation, you were talking about the accessibility of drugs and sort of the change in culture and its usage. And I, I'm from Canada, and I, you can let me know if the trends are similar here, but I think the, the use of recreational drugs, especially some of like the lower, like le- less like harmful drugs like marijuana and things like that, especially with this legalization, um, are being used like recreationally and for health reasons as well. Um, does that concern you as a neuroscientist? It concerns me a lot as a neuroscientist, but, and it concerns me a lot as the, the type of research that I've done. As I mm-hmm. mentioned, you know, we have been studying the developmental effects of cannabis before cannabis was now popular yeah. as now in terms of mainstream, in terms of the legalization has changed. And the, even for, we have been one of the first to look at cannabis, even in terms of treating addiction, in terms yeah. of, you know, cannabidiol. So I agree with you. What people don't understand about the developing brain, you know, we think about development, and like I said to you, you know, most psychiatric disorders really start during early development. Yeah. But the brain continues, as you said, to develop until our mid-20s. That change, those dynamic changes that are occurring, when you have these, you know, I'm going to call it insults, because drugs can be an insult, just as the traumatic environment and abuse that people feel, uh, you know, that they experience can be an insult. So these insults to the brain, Mm. are really um, impacting on those developmental processes. So you change the trajectory of how the brain should develop normally. And that's one of the things about, in fact, you know, having even alcohol and cigarettes and now cannabis during this time period. But I think one of the reasons why we are beginning to see, not beginning, we've seen now a greater impact of cannabis on the developing brain than we did in the past. Yeah. Know, we always, it's because today's cannabis, the potency of the THC in the cannabis is so high. So can you specify what the TH, what THC is just oh, for the sorry. audience? So, yeah. so the, the main psychoactive ingredient in cannabis is THC. And THC, there are many cannabinoids in the in the cannabis plant. In fact, there are over 140 cannabinoids. So is a cannabinoid like a psychoactive agent? A cannabinoid is a psychoactive in, um, agent in that it changes our brain. So many people think, well, first of all, nobody would be smoking cannabis if it didn't do something <laughs> to your brain. So I Fair. want your audience to Fair. realize that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Anything that changes your brain is psychoactive. The question is, is it does it produce harm? Okay. And for many people, as we talked about, and especially earlier, you know, people don't realize that. Cannabis today is not the original cannabis. The original cannabis had about 2% THC. THC is the main psychoactive cannabinoid in the plant. And it is associated, we know, absolutely causally with inducing psychosis and inducing a number of the cognitive effects that we see, the motor coordination, as um, uh, impact on motor coordination and so on that we see. So like in the beginning plant, it was about 2 and to 4% THC. And then they started to grow strains to make the THC content more potent. So the plants today 
can have anywhere from 15 to 24 percent. And some of them are even grown for much more. And there are now many different ways in which people can even consume cannabis or THC and get the pure oil, that they're taking even 70 to 90 percent THC. So that's a different drug. That really blows the brain away. And today's plants, as I said, the plant use, you know, yeah. has a, like over 140 cannabinoids. Another cannabinoid was cannabidiol, CBD. Yeah. And CBD, we know, had protective effects. The, that was one of the, the plant's natural protective. And when they increased THC concentration, they inadvertently reduced the CBD amount. So that ratio of THC to CBD has dramatically changed. And that's also why we think that we're seeing more psychiatric complications from cannabis use than we saw before. If you go into our wards here yeah. um, at Sinai, in our dual diagnosis ward, cannabis is absolutely one of the drugs that, that is um, induces a lot of this psychiatric comorbidity that we see. So many people will say, oh, it's heroin. No, cannabis does this. So heroin has its own issues, yeah, and we yeah. can talk about that. But I want people to realize that cannabis today, perhaps I wouldn't be, you know, I think the legalization was important because, especially in the U.S., I don't know in Canada as much, mm -hmm. you know, they lock up people and criminalize right, it right, in a right. manner that was very destructive yeah. and caused, I talked to you again about environmental stress, community stress that changed generations. That to me was horrible. However, when they legalized it, they made it seem like it's a natural drug, an okay drug, and it's not. If they had even said, okay, the potency should not go over this amount, then perhaps I wouldn't have my big issue. Yeah. But we have young people who are, whose brains are being blown out by a very, very high THC. It is not the cannabis of the past. And either we should you know, call it a different name because it's definitely a different yeah. drug. And all of the synthetic cannabis that's also out there, very different drug. That that's a very interesting perspective. So eff effectively, they've taken the the part of the plant that produces these psychoactive effects, enhanced them, and which is in turn diminished all of the like the, let's say the healthy returns that you can get from the plant. Over what period of time did this take place? Um, actually, I mean, when you look at it, like I said, 1960s, 70s, even 80s, it was probably about 2%. 90s, it got to 4%. It yeah. just kept on going up every decade. And even, so that's another thing also. So people will say, oh, we've done research on cannabis for years, which is actually not true. But when you look at the research that was done even 10 years ago on the cannabis that was available, it's very different from the cannabis that was available today. So for us to even understand the long-term impact of what today's very high potency right. cannabis is doing, we'll have to wait a, a much longer time. That's it. That's it. I, I feel like a lot of people don't understand that or they don't know that distinction, especially when you're a young person engaging in recreational drugs. I think the comment you made about the wards here um, and the sort of psychiatric induced effects that you're seeing from cannabis, I feel like the people that... I like grew up around who were doing these things recreationally. If they were to hear that, they would be a little bit surprised because it was always my understanding growing up as like a young person in high school and then like university and stuff that, oh, like you can't OD on marijuana. Marijuana is not a gateway drug. So is marijuana a gateway drug? Because is, is there a link between that and then like the harder stuff? So, you know, and that's like yeah, such a controversial term. Right. You know, and it is and it isn't. So... Will you overdose on, on cannabis? It's definitely you won't in the same context of like opioids. Opioids mm -hmm. will shut down our breathing center because the, are the receptors where the opioids bind and inhibit that, that you know, can cause um, overdose. Cannabis where or THC, for example, where it binds, the cannabinoid receptors in our brain, they do not um, regulate our breathing centers. So it's not going to mm. cause an overdose like that. However, we have seen, um, I mean, very it's rare, but again, coming back to high potency, young people and even children who accidentally will eat these gummies, for example. Yeah. And then they definitely have gone to emergency room numbers higher and even some mortality. But it's not due to, you know, it's a complicated thing I won't get into. But, sure. um, you know, this, this aspect of gateway, we can 
causally show in our animal models. Yeah. That THC increases the sensitivity to, for example, heroin later in life. So it doesn't, it is a gateway, but alcohol is a gateway. Nicotine is a gateway. So all of these drugs that, you know, people then get access to when they're young definitely can lead to, for those individuals who are more vulnerable, going back to our early part of our conversation, yeah. that becomes a gateway. Is it a gateway for everyone? No. However, this high potency cannabis definitely is much more harmful. And we are going to pay a price for not attending to this now because we're doing research on our children. This is a time period where we're saying to, you know, the politicians are saying we're legalizing everything. So we have a natural experiment going on and we will see which children will develop certain mental disorders or other substance use disorders later in life. They're gambling on that. And I think that that is wrong to gamble right. on our children's future because we know that potency for any drug, cannabis is no different from any other drug. As you increase the potency of the, the most active ingredient, you increase addiction risk and you increase psychiatric risk. That is clear. What we're just going to find out in a few years is who is more vulnerable to that. And that, I think, is ridiculous. We could have made the legalization in a controlled manner that still protected people, still gave people access to um, cannabis in a health manner. Right. For those, you know, like I said, my research yeah, showed yeah. that CBD can be beneficial. So it's not that I'm against cannabis as a medical potential. I think it has me medical um, benefits. But... Everyone thinking that just because you call cannabis healthy, that makes it healthy or said that cannabis is not as, doesn't increase the mortality like opioids. I wouldn't want to compare, do I want to jump off the building at, you know, the fifth floor, the 10th floor, the 20th floor? <laughs> you know, it, it's that kind of comparison, which yeah. makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, it's like, how do we have healthy brains, healthy lives? How do we help people who have disorders that we do have the science to start helping? And it just gets complicated with these societal, you know, nonsense and the politics. It's just nonsense. Right. I, I think you said a number of interesting things there. So you were talking about animal models. So you said that exposure to THC in animal models, so that being like mice, rats, um, animal models in a lab, show uh, you you could demonstrate that exposure to to THC increase the likelihood of heroin usage. So if we see that reflected in animal models, uh, I'm not saying it'll be exactly akin in a human person, but we can, we can infer. Yeah. I mean, epidemiological data shows it in humans. It's just that human data is so complicated because people are like, Oh, well that person, you know, their friends or the environment right. or so on. And so that's what animal models help us to do is it's just says, does this particular agent, does it relate directly? And it doesn't mean that every rat will still do the same. You know, right, the right, rats right. don't have their mothers telling you don't do this. <laughs> or, you know, um, so that's how they are. No one model is perfect, but the, the human epidemiological studies yeah. do show an association. But I think to, to your point there, so that research existed, but it seems like we kind of, in Canada and, and the States largely, like we just kind of, you know, held off, held off, held off, incarcerated a bunch of people who probably shouldn't have gone to jail. And then we just like free reigned open everything. Um, when, and, and there was science that existed um, that could have informed better, better policy. So when you're saying that we're gambling on the future health of our children, that that's to me, like that's getting, making like the hairs on my arm stand up. Like that sounds very scary. I, I want, so you're saying that the potency of, of THC has increased dramatically in recent years and effectively the research done 10 years ago is it's useful, but it's not, it's not even as reflective of what's going on right now. So is, it, is there research that demonstrates the long-term effects of cannabis on the brain? Like, do we know what happens with long-term usage? Yes, there's definitely, you know, um, there, there are a number of studies that have shown, and again, that there are subgroups of people who, who, for whom the outcome is not positive and for others who live perfectly functional lives. The question is, you know, again, yeah, yeah. you know, 
what are the subgroups, and we know, like I said, the behavioral traits, the environmental stressors, and so on, that, and the genetics that contributes to that. We don't yet have data with, as I said, the high potency that we've seen in recent years of THC. So that, unfortunately, is to come. I think from from your research, I, I watched a few of your other talks and read some papers. I, I think something that's really cool that comes out of the animal models is this idea of like a cross-generational effect. Yeah. And we're, it's not been long enough to see it in humans, I guess. Not yet. But like, what, what did you see in that research that's like kind of scary? So, you know, the funny thing is um, sometimes the questions I ask, I, well, often actually, I will tell you that we don't necessarily, people think, oh, you know, you make up the data or you, you, the results you expected. And most of the times our hypotheses, I will tell you, are wrong. And that's why you need to do research. Right, that's science. You know, exactly, exactly. <laughs> people think, you know, so um, in studying the prenatal and adolescent effects of THC, um, and we would see these changes in adulthood, one day I just said to my, my student at that time, um, Jennifer, was that, you know, let's look in the next generation because one of the things that I think your audience and society doesn't understand why I'm optimistic about addiction. Mm -hmm. Many people, when you started off in the beginning about the stigma, I'm optimistic because of the neuroscience that we've seen. So when you look at um, addiction, what we see that's changing the brain on a molecular level, yeah, not this, you know, on a, like we talk about the prefrontal cortex, we see that it's epigenetic changes that occurs. That's what maintains these long-term effects. So genetics are the DNAs that, you know, the genetic blueprint that you inherit from your parents. Right. But those genes and the blueprint can be modified based on the environment. So the drugs are an environmental impact on those. And so you can have genes that should be turned on that are turned off due to drug exposure and vice versa. And what we see that the developmental effects of cannabis relate to, and even other drugs, relate to epigenetic mechanisms. One great thing about epigenetics as compared to your genetics, epigenetics is reversible. So I know mm. that we have the science to reverse some of the things that we see. So when we saw these epigenetic changes, I said to my student, um, epigenetics, the original definition of it was that it needed to be inherited. So I said, let's see what happens to the next generation. So it was just in honoring the guide, um, uh, Waddington, who defined it in the 1950s of epigenetics. Right. I said, let's just see what happens in the next generation. I didn't expect to see anything, <laughs> Fair. but it was surprising that we saw in the next generation and um, a postdoc then took it over because my students said, no way, that's, you know, my, my studies are tough enough. I want to graduate. <laughs> um, and, and so Henrietta Sutzerins came in um, and she said, okay, I'll take on that project. Yeah. And that drove her crazy because we looked at different generations and we could see that in the next generation that didn't get exposed directly to THC, you saw behavioral changes in these animals, even opioid sensitivity and other behavioral changes and molecular changes in their brain. We saw in even into the great grandkids. So Really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. And only because, and we only studied the male line because it was complicated to study both male and female line. Sure. But we studied the male line so that the, the father... And so now we're studying the sperm and we're able now to track how that occurred. I'm not going to tell you because we haven't published that. Part yeah, I, yeah, I want to hear about that. That yeah, sounds really offline, cool. Offline, I'll maybe, tell you. Maybe off camera. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, and so that's fascinating of how this occurs, but it's not surprising. We know that environmental um, experiences can be transmitted to future generations, like the famine in, in Europe. Yeah. You could track it to their great right. grandkids. Right, right, but right. so this was interesting that we could see it with cannabis and it's not just cannabis. I mean, everything, like I said, I think that, you know, what we learned in school, that most of the things that we experience in our lives um, gets kind of erased on a molecular level when you pass, you know, the, right. spe the sperm and egg meats, you know, don't want to tell your audience about the, the <laughs> birds and the bees, but, yeah. you know, so that, then, you know, the, the child starts from scratch. But you actually don't. You pass something on on an epigenetic level that's really fascinating. So this high potency, I'm not going to continue with those studies. They've been so traumatic, and I'm experiencing trauma. They, they take a long time to do, even in animal models. Yeah. And it, in the beginning, nobody wanted to believe us. And, you know, so it's just been 
stressful trying to get grants to continue that work. Fair, fair. Yeah. I think that work is really important. I think what you were able to demonstrate in the animal model is uh, is, is really fascinating. And we're doing it also in humans in terms of oh. the sperm, but not in the Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. very cool. Yeah. I, I think this is like this is a great point to to just to, to pivot a little bit because I feel like uh, largely our conversation has been like negative and you have to be scared and THC is right. bad for you yeah. and blah 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 and all of those things are true. But I think your research offers a lot of promise um, in addressing this like larger problem that we were talking about. So. Um, you, you mentioned that THC is, as one of the active agents, uh, one of a can- cannabinoid in, can- in cannabis, um, that we should be concerned about. Um, but your research focuses on CBD, um, which you say has a lot of properties that we can, we can be optimistic about. Um, so you, you, you use, or you're researching how to, how we can effectively use CBD to treat addiction. Yeah. Um, so can you explain how, how that works and what, what we can see? Maybe before that, um, so I, I think a lot of this research it, it's done in light of tackling one of the pro- like one of our social problems in recent years, um, the opioid epidemic. Um, so if you could speak to how we even got to this point, and then maybe we can talk about why your research is so important. Yeah. So you know, again, like I said, I do research, and I always tell my team the data is the data. So when we were studying the developmental effects of cannabis in our when in humans, I also studied humans, but mm-hmm. in our animal models, we would study THC, like I said. So another question that I had is that our animal models really don't reflect everything in the human. Right. So we're not we weren't giving them cannabis, we we're giving them THC. So I said, let's at least give them another cannabinoid and just to see. And I did not expect the results that we got. So we gave them the animals THC, I mean, sorry, CBD. Yeah. And in contrast to what we saw with THC, the animals actually reduced their heroin seeking behavior. And specifically in animal models, just like in humans who, you know, develop a, a substance an addiction, when you're getting the, the environmental cues start to have take over. And so when they get the drug and they have an, they get an environmental a light or a sound, you, they start associating that environmental cue with getting the drug. So just showing them the cue, they will start pressing away for a lever to get the heroin. Right. And what we saw was that CBD reduced that, that drug-seeking behavior. Nobody, again, believed this. It took us a while to get the paper published initially, and we could even show that in the molecular, some of the molecular changes yeah. CBD could reverse. Wow. But it was really critical because one arm of my research program looks like, as I said, about developmental effects of cannabis. But the other arm, people thought I was crazy. Why am I studying two separate drugs? Looks at opioids. So I have been studying the neurobiology of opioid addiction for a long while, and in large part because I studied the human brain and the drug that has the greatest mortality. So our brain bank collection was much more people who had died from opioid overdose than any other drug. So that's what I've been studying for a very long time. Okay. And the opioid epidemic, you know, hit home a lot where you have people, again, the opioid epidemic, I think, has helped decrease some of the stigma about addiction because people saw that, yeah, you can get a prescription from your doctor because you suffered from pain and you have this opioid prescription and even adult past 25 and so on. And they would then develop an addiction to these opioid prescription um, drugs. Right. And that then changed where, you know, before people were like, oh, it's this person who has bad morals. Now they could see somebody who they related to, especially the suburban people, um, when their kids started dying from opioid overdoses. And that brought a lot of attention. When we saw in our animal model that CBD reduced the drug-seeking behavior, I was like, oh, my God, could this work in humans? So even though we didn't know the mechanism by which CBD was working, I decided crazy enough to try this in humans quicker because I think that's our problem. We know some of the science. We don't translate it quickly enough to help people. And in doing that, I did some pilot studies, and we saw that it replicated what we had in our animals, that CBD reduced craving. One of the things that our humans told us that our rats didn't yeah. <laughs> was that it actually reduced their anxiety. And really? So, yeah. And the cue-induced anxiety. So what people, again, I said earlier, the stress, the anxiety is what triggers drug craving. It's not the reward that I want to get high. That is not addiction. 
it is the reason people continue the cycle is all the negative things that occurs and the intense anxiety, the stress sensitivity. And this is what CBD we are looking at. That's what it's working on. So now we're doing neuroimaging studies in human. We're doing a much larger clinical trials in hundreds of people. Hopefully we'll get to the hundreds. Yeah. And we're also now going back to our animals and looking at how CBD is doing that. And it's fascinating. I, I, that sounds ex- incredibly promising. Um, I, I'm, I know like there's a, a lot of bureaucracy around bringing things to market. Huge. Um, I understand that. Um, but what, what do you think like a timeline could look like for, for that to be widely available? Because clearly it's efficacious. Um, I think one thing that's really interesting about that finding is that um, I think people, even myself, like you think that addiction people are chasing a high. I don't even think that language is correct. I think it's the idea is, of re- reducing that anxiety associated with, with the drug in the, in the phraseology that you use is, is craving. I think people can relate to that. Like, a really watered down example would be like craving food. Um, you have like, if you have a bag of chips sitting there, you're probably going to eat it and eating it is probably not even that satisfying. It's just the restlessness of sitting there with it, like staring at you. Right. <laughs> and addiction is like a whole order of magnitude above that. But the fact that we can use CBD to, to, to tame that, I, I think is so promising because uh, in, in my country, Canada, like uh, Vancouver and, Toronto, there's some, there's some suburbs around Toronto where, where the opioid epidemic is, is really, bad. yeah, it's really bad. And this, this sounds like a, a solution that, that would be cost effective and easy to administer. Um, and CBD does not have the, the mental health risk that we see with THC, for example. Okay. And so that's also another reason you want to develop a, a medication that will not produce more harm than good. Right, right. And this is one of the things. It's not addictive. So that's a very important for me. In terms yeah, of, yeah. You know, we want to um, have medications that people can go and pick up and then, but there are a lot of co- companies that have built around now the CBD market, but we have to make sure that we bring in good actors for medicinal CBD, because I do think that CBD and medicinal cannabis can be um, beneficial for people but it has been a journey. Yeah. So as I, even for the other study, it took us forever to get our CBD paper published. So over a decade ago, and then, oh, wow. and then okay. I have been pushing. So now, you know, people are, Oh, you know, CBD can um, treat opiate addiction. That was our research. And it has been a fight. So because people don't realize I couldn't just go and do these studies to prove it. You have to get grants. Yeah. Your peers don't believe it either. So it's not even, so initially nobody believed, believed us. And then everybody started rushing into the space. So you have now people believing that CBD can quote unquote cure, but the research hasn't fully gotten there yet. So for me, right. even though I believe this, I still think that you need double blinded placebo controlled studies yeah, yeah, of to really figure out dose, figure out who may be you know, best even to get this. I don't think that there's going to be one treatment for anything on this planet. And an addiction as compared to many other disorders, many disorders are very heterogeneous, many psychiatric disorders. We, we call something, you know, the depression and schizophrenia and addiction, but under there are subgroups. And so I expect it's one subgroup that may benefit the most and we should find that out. Right, right. So, you know, it's been a journey, but the timeline I'm hoping in the next five years, the FDA will approve. Oh, know, that'd be fantastic. CBD. Yeah. I really uh, and I hope Canada has a, if we all work together, yeah. that's another thing for me. We should fast track. COVID has showed us that it, with all scientists working globally, right, right. they were able to figure out the vaccines based on technology. People don't realize the technology had been developed. It was just not fast track. And having, being able to test how many millions of people? There are a lot of the heroes in COVID were the people who took the vaccine to start. That's why we're here today and trying to get back to normal life. Mm. But you need to have that fast tracking all together. We could do this. We could find addiction treatments much faster working together. Yeah, um, I, your your research sounds incredibly promising. Um, I'm your optimism is is very infectious. I don't know if it comes through on camera, but. Um, I can tell that it, this, this means a lot to you and you're doing really innovative work. 
I could talk to you all day, but that's just about our time. So where can, where can, um, like people find you? How can they support your work? Um, reach out to like all those good things. Yeah. So look me up at Mount Sinai. My email is there. If I don't answer the first time, you know, (laughs) I do get thousands of emails, but, um, it's really important for me that people understand addiction more and perhaps just try to decrease the the bias that we all have, Mm -hmm. me included, and just realize that we need, in order for our society to function as optimal as it can be, we need the science to help people and the science is there. And I think that we just need to encourage more people to get help, but they don't get help because of the stigma. So I think that we all contribute to it, but there is hope. Absolutely. The science says there's hope. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Hurd. Thank you so much for having me.